An aircraft engine usually can be run several hundred hours before it has to be reconditioned. The engine on this airplane has done a lot of flying and it's due for an overhaul. It's a little engine, but it runs on exactly the same principles as the big jobs. And the inspections and repairs you'll do on it are basically the same. So let's get the airplane inside the hangar and go to work. While you're letting the engine one of the first things you ought to do is be sure all the tools you'll need for the job are handy. You don't want to waste time hunting for the right tool. And that means you'll have not only screwdrivers, wrenches, drifts, and the like, but measuring gauges, containers, funnels, clean rags, and metal tags for marking parts as they're taken from the engine. You'll also need an engine manual containing a table of limits and helpful instruction on proper procedures. Since you're interested cheaply in the cylinders, the preliminary steps you take before removing the cylinders will be covered quickly. Check the ignition switch and fuel shutoff valve to be sure they're both off. Move the engine's cowling, including the baffles. On this airplane, you'll have to remove the propeller to get the front cowling off. Now you can spray the whole engine with cleaning solvent and dry it with compressed air to get rid of the oil and dirt that's accumulated. And always keep a fire extinguisher handy for an emergency. Next, disconnect the ignition wiring from spark plugs. Then remove the spark plugs themselves from the engine. Now you'll have to take off the exhaust stacks and disconnect the intake pipes from the cylinders. Then the push rod housings can be disconnected and you'll be ready to pull the cylinders. You'll find an exploded diagram of the cylinder and valve assembly in the engine manual. You're concerned now only with the cylinders. Later, the valve mechanism will have to be gone over. Pal nuts are used on this engine to safety the cylinder hold down nuts. Remove them first. It's always a good idea to string nuts on a piece of wire. Get lost. With the pal nuts off, remove four of the six hold down nuts, leaving two nuts on temporarily to hold the cylinder in place. Before pulling the cylinder, put the piston at the top of its stroke so that you can get at it when the cylinder's off. You can do this easily by turning the crankshaft with a timing tool and watching the piston through a spark plug insert. Now you can remove the last two nuts and the cylinder will be free to come off. There are several things to remember when pulling a cylinder. Do it carefully. Pull the cylinder out straight. Use one hand to support the piston so it won't bang down against the engine when the cylinder comes free. Keeping one hand on the piston, lay the cylinder down carefully. Now push out the full floating wrist pin that holds the piston to the connecting rod. And when you take the piston off, let the rod down gently so it won't drop against the port. Whenever you tear an engine down, you have to be sure each part goes back in its original position. There are so many identical parts that you can't remember where each one goes, so tag it as you take it off. Metal identification tags are best because you can dunk them in cleaning fluid and the number won't come off. 
soon as the cylinders are pulled, be sure you cover up the open cylinder port so dirt, loose wire, nuts, or tools can't get inside accidentally. When you've removed all the cylinders and pistons, and covered up all the open ports, you can move to a workbench where it's easier to make your inspection and repairs. Your overhaul job will be a whole lot easier if you're systematic about it. Line up the cylinders and pistons so you can work on them in order. Notice that all the parts are tagged, so there'll be no question where they go when you reinstall them. Now you can go to work on the cylinders. Take the push rods out and lay them aside, and take the connections off the push rod housings. Now, remove the six screws that hold the rocker box cover to the cylinder. There's no safety wire to cut here because lock washers are used instead. Remove the rocker box cover so you can get at the rocker arms. Sometimes the gasket will stick to the parting surface. You can loosen it with a flat blade, but don't use a sharp screwdriver as it may damage the parting surface. This rocker arm shaft comes out easily. Sometimes you'll have to tap them out with a soft drift. Be sure to tag the rocker arm so you'll know which is exhaust and which is intake. You're ready now to clean the cylinder. A revolving wire brush on the end of a drill is good for removing carbon from the head. Be careful, though, not to scratch the cylinder walls with it. The outside dirt and oil will come off by using a spray gun and cleaning solvent. Then compressed air will not only dry the cylinder, but will blow off dirt and carbon. Before you can take the valve assembly apart, place the cylinder over a wooden form that fits the inside of the cylinder head. This will hold the valves in place when the springs are compressed. You'll also need a simple tool like this to compress the springs. A pair of tweezers is handy for picking out the little split locks. They're hard to pick out with your fingers. With the split locks removed, the compressing tool can be taken away and the parts lifted out the spring retainer, and the inner and outer springs. You can get the spring seat out with the tweezers, too. Hold the valve stems as you take the cylinder off the form so they won't drop out. Take care when removing the valves not to let them scratch or dent the cylinder walls. Now examine the cylinder head very carefully. A 10-power magnifying glass is a big help. If cracks are found, or if the head is loose, the whole cylinder will have to be replaced. Examine the cooling fins carefully for cracks. One of the fins on this cylinder is chipped and will have to be repaired so it won't get bigger. Profiling is what the repair job is called. 
Use a round file at the apex of the crack to prevent it from growing further. Then use a flat file to smooth off the edges. Next, inspect the flange for nicks, evenness, and condition of the hold-down nut recesses. The rough edges of any nicks you find can be smoothed down. A fine stone dipped in oil is the correct tool for this. Then polish the spot with a piece of crocus cloth. Examine the inside of the cylinder by barrel thoroughly for dents and scoring. The wall of this cylinder is in good condition. Sometimes you'll find a cylinder has been scored, like this one. This cylinder would have to be rebored before it can be used again, or perhaps replaced. Since the cylinder barrel is in good shape, you can go ahead with the job. You're ready now to check for out of round and taper. First, look up the maximum allowed in the table of limits. The taper wear and out of round allowed is two thousandths of an inch. Use a dial indicator to check the cylinder bore. Set the dial to zero. As you glide the indicator along the barrel, watch the dial to see if the pointer varies more than two thousandths of an inch. The taper of this cylinder is satisfactory, so you're ready to check the diameter of the cylinder. With the inside micrometer, take one measurement at right angles to the crankshaft. Take a second measurement in a direction parallel with the crankshaft. A comparison of these measurements will tell you if the cylinder is out of round. Record the larger diameter of the cylinder barrel on a check sheet. Later on, you will measure the piston and subtract its diameter from the diameter of the cylinder. In that way, you will find out if the clearance between the piston and cylinder checks with the table of limits. It's a good idea to check the threads of the spark plug inserts. Damaged threads can be fixed up by chasing them with a tap that has the proper size metric thread. Now take the intake elbow off and examine the parting surface. Take the gasket off and inspect the intake flange and exhaust flange for nicks and imperfections that might need stoning. Look at the studs, too. Here's one that will have to be replaced because the threads are in bad shape. The best way to get an old stud out is with the stud remover turning it slowly so as not to damage the threads in the stud hole. This stud should be discarded and a new one installed. If there's any sign of looseness in the old stud, the new one ought to be the next oversize. Before installing the new stud, 
Make sure the threads in the hole weren't damaged when the old stud was taken out. If you find them in good condition, coat the new stud lightly with a compound that will ensure tightness and run it down finger tight in the hole. One method of tightening the new stud is to use two nuts. Put them on so they face each other. Then lock them together tightly. Now you can turn the outer one with a wrench and the stud will turn. Drive the new stud in tight and then make sure it's the same length as the others. You've now finished reconditioning this cylinder. When the other three have been gone over in the same way, next next job will be on the pistons. When you come to them, you'll have to scrape and clean them first. Inspect them carefully for defects. Measure them to check clearances. And finally, install a new set of rings. After the cylinders have been reconditioned, the next job is to clean, inspect, and repair the piston parts and to check clearances to determine how much wear has taken place. You'll find an exploded drawing of the piston assembly in your engine manual. When inspecting and reconditioning pistons, you'll be concerned with the piston itself, the piston rings, the piston pin or wrist pin as it is more commonly called, the piston pin plugs, the bushing in the connecting rod, and the connecting rod itself. Here's the way its piece parts go together. The piston pin bushing and connecting rod actually is a pressed in part of the rod and is not removed during an overhaul. The connecting rod fits, fits into the piston in this manner. The piston pin plugs fit snugly into the ends of the piston pin like this. The piston pin is then inserted through the piston and the connecting rod bushing and holds the piston to the connecting rod. The piston rings are installed around the piston. And eventually, the piston assembly will be installed inside the cylinder. There must be correct clearance between these parts to assure proper lubrication. One of the most important is the clearance between the outside of the piston and the inside of the cylinder. The two surfaces at the ends of the piston pin, where the pin fits into the bosses in the piston, also must have proper specified clearances. And the center of the piston pin, where the pin goes through the connecting rod bushing, likewise must fit properly. Now let's get back to the pistons themselves. Take a good look at the piston rings. They may give you a clue to trouble. These rings seem to be okay. An example of what you may run to, however, is this piston from another engine. Some of the rings are seized. That is, overheating has welded them tightly to the ring grooves. Notice the blow-by marks on the rings where hot expanding gases have escaped. A condition like this would most likely score the cylinder seriously, like this, and cause a distinct loss of power. However, it were the rings on the piston you are inspecting are in good shape, and you can go ahead and remove them. To get them off easily, you'll need a ring spreader that grips the ends of the ring and spreads the gap. When you have all the rings off, you can start cleaning. And this is a lengthy job. 
The heaviest carbon can be loosened with a scraper. You can make a scraper by putting an edge on a piece of aluminum, like this one. If you make a scraper, be sure to use soft metal that won't scratch the piston. You'll need another scraper with one end narrowed to fit the ring grooves. When most of the carbon has been scraped off, the parts are ready for a soaking in King solvent. Keep the pistons, ends, and plugs in sets so they don't get mixed up. When using some of the harsher cleaning solvents, wear rubber gloves to protect your hands. This cleaner is mild enough to make that unnecessary. Let the parts soak until the solvent has had a chance to loosen the remaining carbon and dirt. When certain kinds of cleaner are used, it's necessary to rinse off the parts with hot water. Now you can probably get the parts thoroughly clean with a little more scraping. Getting these pistons that have had a lot of use clean is a painstaking job. But when you're finished, each one of them ought to shine like new. Poke out the oil relief holes spaced around the head with an undersized drill to be sure no dirt has clogged the openings. Now you can finish off the cleaning job in good shape with a spray gun and cleaning solvent. The gun will force cleaning fluid into all the corners. Then the same gun, disconnected from the solvent, will dry and further clean the piston with compressed air. After inspecting each of the piston pin plugs, try them in the piston pin for fit. This one's too loose and should be discarded. Make a note to, to get a new plug for this pin. To detect cracks or scoring that you might otherwise miss, use a 10 power magnifying glass. Here's a nick that can be repaired. Use a fine stone dipped in oil to smooth the nick down, following the contour of the pin with the stone. Then polish the spot with a piece of crocus cloth. Now you want to check the piston pin for straightness. You'll need a dial indicator and a pair of V-blocks set up on a surface plate. Lay the pin in the V-blocks and place it directly under the indicator arm. Set the dial so the needle points to zero. As you rotate the pin, watch the dial for any variation. This pin is perfectly straight. Next, you want to measure the diameter of the pin at each end, where it fits into the bosses in the piston and in the center, where it fits into the connecting rod bushing. You'll remember where these clearances are. Use a micrometer of the right size to get these diameters and have your check sheet handy to record them. You'll use a micrometer many, many times. And, in fact, a good deal of the effectiveness of the overhaul job will depend upon your skill in using this tool. Take two measurements at each point and record them. Take the measurements at right angles to each other. If there's a difference in the two readings, 
the smaller is the one to use. Taking two measurements at each of three points on the four pins, you'll have 24 micrometer readings to take. You'll need the magnifying glass to inspect the piston also. Scoring, cracks, or corrosion will show up more clearly. This piston appears to be in good condition. Now you want to be sure the clearance of the piston in the cylinder is satisfactory. You'll recall that this clearance was pointed out. Using the proper size micrometer, measure the diameter of the piston at the skirt and record the readings on your check sheet. Take measurements at three points on the bearing surface of the piston at the skirt, and if there's any variation in the readings, use the smallest one. When you measure the cylinder, you recorded its skirt diameter. Now record the piston diameter and subtract to get the clearance. Check this clearance against the table of limits. The piston in the cylinder can have a clearance between 14 and 17 thousandths. That means your clearance is okay. A visual inspection of the ring grooves is next in order. Watch particularly for signs of steps worn into the grooves. Now examine the piston pin bosses for scores, cracks, or evidences of wear. This boss appears to be in good condition. You still need to check the clearance between the boss and the piston pin. To measure the diameter of the boss, use a telescoping gauge and a micrometer. By taking readings in two directions, you can tell whether or not the boss is out of round. Record the maximum inside diameter of the boss on your check sheet. A few minutes ago, you measured the diameter of the piston pin where it fits into this bus. Now subtract the diameter of the pin from the diameter of the boss and get the clearance. This clearance must then be checked with the table of limits to be sure it's satisfactory. To complete your check of piston pin clearances, you'll need to go back to the engine to get the diameter of the piston pin bearing in the connecting rod. Use a telescoping gauge and micrometer in the same way you took the diameter of the bosses. Again, it's standard practice to take the diameter in more than one direction. And if there's variation, use the largest one. Now subtract the center diameter of the piston pin from the diameter of the connecting rod bushing. This will give you your final clearance, which must also be checked with the table of limits. Your last job is to install new rings on the pistons. Each piston on this engine has four rings, two compression and two oil control rings. You'll have to check the gap of each of these rings. To do this, you'll need the cylinder. Install the piston in the cylinder barrel in its operating position. Wipe the ring clean and dry so you'll get an accurate measurement. Then compress the ring and place it in the cylinder. <laughs> 
piston out so it will square up the ring. Use a feeler gauge to check the gap of the compressed piston ring. You'll find proper gap allowances given in the table of limits. It's not unusual to find the gap too small. When you do, you'll have to file the ends of the ring down. To do this, clamp a smooth file securely in a soft jawed vise. Then hold the ends of the ring squarely against the file so the ends will remain parallel and move the ring up and down. down. When you feel you've enlarged the gap sufficiently, make another check. This ring is okay now. Each new ring should be checked in the same way to be sure the gaps are those specified in the table of limits. The next step is to install the rings. First and down with the open end facing up. The right ring must be installed in the right groove. This is an oil scraper ring. Notice the undercut edge. Grip the ends of the ring with the ring spreader. This oil scraper ring should be installed with the undercut edge toward the open end of the piston. Now turn the piston over so you can get out the other three grooves. Install another oil ring having a similarly undercut edge next. This ring is also installed with the undercut edge toward the open end of the piston in the third groove from the top. Next, install a plain compression ring in the second groove from the top. And finally, install the top compression ring in the top groove with the beveled edge toward the top. On some engines, the top of the ring is marked to avoid confusion. One more check you'll have to make is for side clearance of each ring in its groove. The allowable clearance for each ring is given in the table of limits. Hold the ring firmly seated in the groove when you use the feeler gauge and run the feeler all the way around the piston. This top compression ring fits too tightly in the groove. The proper feeler gauge can't be inserted. That means the ring has to be left. Use a smaller gauge to determine how much metal will have to be removed. Before lapping, mic the ring all around. Then when you mic it again later, you'll know how much metal you've removed. The lapping tools you'll need are a surface plate, a memory clay cloth, and a wood disc with, with a groove to hold the ring. Lay the ring squarely in the groove with top side up. Lap with a light touch, moving the ring evenly over the emery cloth. To avoid heavier lap lapping, where your fingers touch the disc, move the fingers often to different positions. <laughs> 
frequently, so, so you don't do much. Take it out of the disc and wipe it off before making it so you'll get an accurate measurement. Then use the micrometer at short intervals all the way around so you'll know if you're lapping evenly. You may have to stop lapping and mic the ring several times before you have it just right. Give it a final check with the correct size feeler gauge. You may find it necessary to lap all the new rings or you may find some of them satisfactory. The new rings is installed, your overhaul of the piston is finished. Each piston is gone over with the same care and put into first class condition. Before reinstalling the pistons, however, the valve assembly must be serviced. That operation will include taking the valve assembly apart, cleaning the parts, inspecting them carefully, checking the tension of the springs, measuring the parts to check clearances, refacing the valves when necessary, and finally lapping them into their seats. The parts lined up and tagged, you're ready to disassemble the valve mechanism. After cleaning the cylinder, remove the rocker box cover so you can get at the valves. If the gasket sticks, loosen it with a flat blade, being careful not to damage the parting surface. Now you can get at the various parts of the valve mechanism. Push out the rocker arm shaft and remove the rocker arms. Tag each rocker arm to identify it as intake or exhaust. Next, place the cylinder on a wooden form to hold the valves in place and compress the valve springs so you can pick out the split locks. This allows you to remove the spring retainer, the springs, and the spring seats. Then you can remove the valves. Don't let them scratch the cylinder walls when you take them out. Your job now will be to clean, inspect, and repair these valve parts and to check clearances. Soaking the parts in a cleaning solvent will loosen accumulations of carbon, corrosion, and dirt. Keep the, the parts grouped as they come from the cylinder so they don't get mixed up. While the parts are soaking, you have some work to do on the cylinder head. Inspect the rocker shaft holes with a magnifying glass. Look for cracks or any burrs or nicks that should be stone smooth. If these surfaces are in good condition, your next job is to measure the diameter of the holes with a telescoping gauge and micrometer. These diameters will be used later to get the clearance with the shaft. By taking the diameter in two directions, you'll find out if the holes are out of round. Record the larger reading on your check sheet. Now you can remove the valve parts from the cleaner and dry them and clean them some more with a compressed air gun. Use a magnifying glass to inspect both exhaust and intake rocker arm arms for cracks, burrs, or other imperfections. Give the bearing that's pressed into the hole in the rocker arm a close inspection. 
The inspection should include the socket into which the bush rod fits. And the surface that the valve stem touches. With a telescoping gauge and micrometer, measure the diameter of the bearing. Take a reading in two directions to check for out of round. If there is a difference in the readings, record the larger one. Inspect and measure both rocker arms in the same way. Now examine the rocker shaft carefully for cracks. This shaft seems to be in good condition, so go ahead and measure its diameter. Measurements are taken at five points where it fits into the two rocker arm bearings and where it goes, goes through the three shaft holes in the cylinder head. When you have made all these measurements, you have the information for figuring the clearances. First, from the diameter of the rocker arm bearing, subtract the diameter of the rocker shaft at that point. Make a similar computation for each rocker arm. Then, from the diameter of the three shaft holes in the cylinder head, subtract the diameter of the shaft. Then, check these clearances with the table of limits in the manual. Your clearances are okay. At some point in your inspection, test the push rods for straightness. If they're bent, they won't roll smoothly on a surface plate. The sound made by dropping them will tell you if the ball ends are tight. They are a pressed fit. Feel the ends to be sure they're smooth and not worn. Then, with an air gun, blow out the oil passages. Now, inspect the other parts of the valve assembly. The valve spring retainer should be looked over for cracks, nicks, burrs, and wear. Check both the inner and outer valve springs carefully for fractures or corrosion. Examine the ends of the spring, particularly for splitting. This spring has a broken end which can't be repaired. It will have to be replaced with a new one. Both outer and inner springs should get a similar examination. Look the spring seat over carefully also. When both sets have been examined, you'll need to test the pressure of the springs. Your table of limits gives the specified tension. First, set the tester for the specified height. Then turn the dial to zero. Now compress a spring and watch the dial. 
test the outer springs and then look up the specifications for the inner springs. Reset the tester to those specifications and check the tension of the inner springs. Continuing your inspection, examine the valve spring retainer locks for wear or for galling on the outside. Check them also for snug fit on the valve stem. These split locks are extremely important. If they fail when the engine is operating, the valve will drop into the cylinder and cause serious damage. Next, test the fit of the valve guides in the cylinder head. If either of them is loose, a new guide must be installed. A check will have to be made of the clearance between the valve stem and valve guide. So you'll need to measure the inside diameter of the guide with a small hole gauge and micrometer. Measure the diameter of the guide at several points along its length. Record this diameter for the moment on your check sheet. Now give the valves themselves a very thorough inspection. Look for cracks on the end of the valve stem, in the valve head, and in the grooves for the retainer locks. Check the stem for scoring and pitting. Inspect the face for warping, pitting, or burning. This valve face is pitted and needs to be refaced. For comparison, here's the other valve. It doesn't need refacing. Refacing consists of grinding to remove pits and to true up the face. But before refacing this valve, Measure the diameter of the valve stem to get the clearance in the guide. Use the smallest of several measurements made along the stem. The diameter of the stem is subtracted from the diameter of the, the guide to obtain this clearance, which is figured for both the exhaust and intake valves. Then check these clearances in the table of limits. Now to reface the valve you found pitted. When putting the valve in the chuck of the refacing machine, it's important to set the valve face at the correct angle to the grinding wheel. Valve faces usually have either a 30 or 45 degree angle. Don't change the original angle of the face. Now adjust valve face to the grinding wheel. In moving the valve across the grinder, take light cuts and move slowly. Carry each movement all the way across the grinding wheel. And grind away as little as possible, only enough to remove the pitting. You can determine by inspection when the face has been ground enough to remove the pitting, not, en not enough to feather the edge. All the valves are lapped into their seats to assure a perfect leak-proof fit. First, apply a valve lapping compound to the valve face, dabbing it on sparingly. Wipe the stem clean and insert the valve in its guide. 
holes fitted over the stem as a good lapping tool. Roll the hose between your fingers with a medium pole exerted on the valve. Change the position of the valve on its seat frequently. The valve compound should be changed often. Be sure to wipe off the old compound before applying new. You may have to change compound several times. You can usually tell when the valve face has been properly lapped by its appearance. It will look to be frosted, like this. Notice that the frosted surface is in the center of the face. When both valves have been lapped, a test can be made. Put plugs into the spark plug insert so they won't leak. Then clean off the compound from the valve and seats and put the valves back into their guides. Now pour enough gasoline into the cylinder to test the seal of the valve faces against their seats. If, after 20 minutes, no gasoline has leaked through, the valve has been properly lapped in. If there's a leak, the valve will need to be lapped again until, until a leak fit has been obtained. Finally, inspect the parting surface of the rocker box for dents nicks and scratches. Do the same with the cover. The cover must fit perfectly on the rocker box to prevent oil leaks and if necessary stone the parting surfaces to obtain such a fit. You have now inspected the complete valve mechanism and repaired the parts when as necessary. Here's the way the valve assembly goes together. The valve guides and valve seat inserts are not removed from the cylinder. Here they're separated from the cylinder so you can see there. The first step in reassembly is insertion of the valves through the guides from inside the cylinder. The spring seats are then installed. Then the outer springs. Then the inner springs. Then the spring retainers. Then the split locks that hold the assembly together. The rocker arms are not installed until the cylinder has been replaced on the engine. Now to put the actual valve mechanism together. First, oil the valves thoroughly and assemble them in their guides. Use a heavy engine oil. Holding the valve stems with one hand, slip the cylinder over the wooden form used before. Install the spring seat, the inner and outer springs, and the spring retainer. Then compress the springs with the special tool. Now you can set the retainer split locks in place. When you've assembled both valves in the same way, the cylinder can be prepared for reinstallation. Install new rubber pushrod housing connections and clamps on the pushrod housings. Then install a new oil seal packing on the cylinder barrel base. Now, when you have oiled the inside of the barrel thoroughly, 
The cylinder will be ready to reinstall on the engine. When all of the cylinders have been similarly prepared on the bench, take them to the airplane. Uncover the ports which you protected and take a look inside to be sure no tools have been left there. Oil the piston thoroughly, working the oil in around the rings. Don't forget to oil the pin. Then install the piston to the connecting rod. Check to see that the ring gaps are staggered. You'll need a helper to compress the rings with a clamping band while you slip the cylinder barrel over the top of the piston. Work the cylinder on gradually, pushing the clamping band ahead of you. When the cylinder has passed the top three rings, shift the clamping band to the bottom ring. The band can now be removed and the cylinder flange fitted carefully over the studs. The hold down nuts can then be reinstalled. Tighten the hold down nuts slowly and evenly with a torque wrench to ensure proper tightness and evenness. Safety the hold down nuts with towel nuts, installing the open end up. With the nut run down finger tight, give it a quarter turn with a wrench. Now you can install the rocker arm, fitting the ends over the push rod and valve and securing it in place with the rocker shaft. The rocker arm should be oiled, and be sure you have the intake and exhaust arms in their right locations. When both rocker arms are in place, Put a new gasket on the rocker box cover and reinstall the cover. Finally, slip the push rod connections and clamps down over the housing flange and tighten the clamps. Then reconnect the intake pipes to the intake elbow on the cylinder. And last, reinstall the spark plugs and reconnect the ignition wires. When that's done, you can install the propeller and the baffles and start the engine. The overhaul of the engine, the crankshaft and connecting rods have been cleaned and inspected, and the various clearances between parts have been checked. The next part to be inspected is the camshaft. Examine the camshaft gear carefully for cracks. Pay particular attention to the teeth to be sure none of them show signs of excessive wear. Inspect the camshaft for cracks or nicks.
check the bearing surfaces and cam lobes for wear, scoring, or pitting. This camshaft appears to be in good condition, so you can go ahead with your measurements to obtain clearances. There are three bearing surfaces on the camshaft where it fits into the crankcase. The diameter of the shaft at each of these three points must be measured, and later you'll measure the bearings in the crankcase to get the clearances. Use the micrometer on these bearing surfaces the same as you did on the crankshaft. Measure in at least two directions, and if there's a variation, use the smaller diameter. Record the diameter on your check sheet for future reference. Check the center bearing surface in the same way, taking two readings at right angles to each other. Record the smaller reading, and then check the diameter of the bearing surface at the front end of the camshaft. This completes your work on the camshaft, and the next step is to inspect the hydraulic cam lifts. Remove the tag temporarily so it won't get in your way. And look the tappet over carefully to be sure it's in good condition. Now measure the outside diameter of the tappet. Later, you'll measure the guide in the crankcase into which the tappet fits, so you can figure the clearance. The purpose of all measuring of clearances is to discover wear on parts that wouldn't be visible to the naked eye. Record this diameter on your check sheet for the time being. In the same way, inspect and measure each one of the eight hydraulic tappets. Next, check the oil pump parts. Examine the driven gear carefully, looking especially for wear on the gear teeth. Then inspect the drive gear and shaft. Replace the gears and the cover so you can check the clearance between the teeth and the cover. To make this check, use a feeler gauge as a go-no-go -no -go gauge. Use a feeler one size over the specified maximum clearance. It should not be able to enter between the edge of the tooth and the cover. Then select a feeler one size under the specified minimum clearance. You should be able to insert this one easily. Make this check for every tooth on each of the two gears. These clearances are a check on the efficiency of the pump. Now remove the drive gear and measure the diameter of its shaft with a micrometer.
telescoping gauge. Check the clearance of the shaft with the hole in the gear case cover. Now put the plate back on and tighten the nuts so you can check for excessive play of the gears or for binding. If it's satisfactory, you can remove the cover again and continue your inspection. Inspect the tachometer drive housing and check its fit on the shaft of the drive gear. Inspect the parts of the oil pressure relief valve to see that they are in good condition. And finally, give the gear case cover itself a thorough visual inspection. The two halves of the crankcase are next in order. Inspect each case closely for fatigue cracks or other evidences of weakness. Note the studs particularly to be sure they're tight and straight and that their threads are in good condition. If the threads look as though they might be stretched, check them by running a nut down on the stud. The nut should run down freely and shouldn't bind if the threads are okay. Sometimes cracks develop at the bolt holes, so be sure to make a thorough inspection of each hole. Make certain that the parting surfaces are smooth so the sections will fit together tightly. If you find any nicks, stone them down. The parting surfaces should make a tight seal. Lift out each bearing half from its seat so you can inspect both the bearing and its seat thoroughly. The seat into which the bearing fits sometimes gets cracked or worn. And the bearing itself is subject to scoring and scratching. However, these appear to be okay. There are three main bearings for the crankshaft and three more for the camshaft. Each of these should be given a careful examination. The other half of the crankcase should be inspected in the same way. You'll remember that you measured the crankshaft bearing surfaces where they fit into the crankcase. Now you want to measure the crank bearings and get clearances. In order to measure the diameter of the bearings, you'll have to put the two halves of the crankcase back together temporarily. To get accurate measurements of the bearing diameters, bolt the sections together by tightening the nuts on all bearing studs. Now measure the diameter of the bearings. Take your measurements in at least two directions and use the larger one if there's a variation. 
you can figure the clearance between the crankshaft and the crankcase bearings at this point. Subtracting, you get three thousandths of an inch. You'll find the allowable clearance shown in the table of limits in your manual. Your clearance of three thousandths is satisfactory then. Next, take the diameter of the rear main bearing, the one at the other end of the crankcase. Use the telescoping gauge and micrometer in exactly the same way and figure your clearance by looking up on the check sheet the diameter of the crankshaft at this point. You'll, you'll have to reach down through a cylinder port to get at the center main bearing to measure it. Otherwise, the procedure is exactly the same. Now you'll have to take readings of the three camshaft bearings in the crankcase. This is the rear one. Again, if there's a variation, take the larger reading. With this reading, you can figure the clearance with the camshaft by subtracting. Your result should be checked against the table of limits. The center and front bearing measurements for the camshaft will have to be taken by reaching through the cylinder port. They must be taken, however, and the clearance is checked for each one. After removing the nuts, take the two halves of the crankcase apart again so you can measure the hydraulic tappet guides. With a telescoping gauge, check the inside diameter of each guide. Take your measurements at at least two points in the guide, and if there's a variation, use the larger diameter. Now you can figure the clearance of the tappet in the guide. Check your result against the table of limits. Measure each of the hydraulic tappet guides in the same way, and make certain that all the clearances are within the allowable limits. You've now completed all the checking of clearances for this section, and there's left only an inspection of the remaining miscellaneous parts. Remove all the connections from the intake pipes and take the clamps off the connections. Then inspect each of the intake pipes carefully for cracks and dents. 
proper connections are always installed at the time of an overhaul. As you put the old clamps back on the new rubber, inspect each clamp. If any of them are broken or don't work properly, new ones should replace them. the intake pipes and their connections have been put into condition, inspect the pushrod housing flanges. Check the parting surfaces particularly to be sure they're smooth. Next, go over each of the eight pushrod connections. Install a new set of rubbers in the clamps and discard the old ones. See that the threads of the tightening screws are in good condition. With this inspection, you've finished your overhaul of the engine and you're ready to reassemble the parts and reinstall the engine. In this major overhaul of an aircraft engine, your job will be to clean the parts of the disassembled engine, inspect and repair them and check all specified clearances against the table of limits. To review quickly the disassembly procedure, you'll recall that the engine was removed from the airplane and mounted on an engine stand. Then it was disassembled. The cylinders and pistons were removed. The oil sump was also removed from the crankcase. Then the gear case cover. And finally, the two halves of the crankcase were separated to get at the insides of the engine. This made it possible to lift out the crankshaft and connecting rods and the other internal part of the engine. With the engine torn down, your first job is to clean every last part thoroughly. Scrub all the smaller parts, like connecting rods, in a tub of cleaning solvent. Use a stiff brush to do a thorough job. When you finish cleaning the small parts, dunk the crankshaft in the... A brush will help you clean in around the throws, journals, and bearing surfaces. When you dry the shaft with the compressed air gun, use the air stream to bow out and clean the oil passages on the crankshaft. This is a must in engine overhaul. Clean both halves of the crankcase inside and out. It's a good idea to dip the whole thing in a beating solvent. All the dirt, oil, and sludge that gather on the metal must be removed. When it's clean, dry the crankcase off carefully with compressed air. Be very sure the oil passages in the case are clear. Blow them out with air and cleaning solvent. Before cleaning the oil sump, Make a careful search for metal particles that may have chipped off the engine. Wipe out the inside with a clean rag. Loose particles of metal might be a clue to serious trouble in an engine. If you should find any chips like this, determine the kind of metal and look for the cause. Clean every part you've disassembled with equal thoroughness. Cleaning of all the engine parts not only makes your inspection more efficient, 
but it allows you to check clearances with greater accuracy. When all your cleaning is finished, and the arch island like new, you're ready to inspect the crankshaft. The crankshaft is the most vital part of any engine, and it must be in perfect condition. First in order is a visual inspection of the shaft. Inspect the propeller nut threads. Look for cracks, scores, or other damage. Inspect the propeller key for burrs or signs of wear, and check it in the keyway to be sure it fits properly. This should be a very snug fit. Ordinary visual inspection of the crankshaft is not enough, however, as fractures can't always be seen. The use of some kind of particle inspection is a more certain test. In the magnetic particle inspection, the crankshaft is magnetized by sending a charge of electric current through it. The shaft is then thoroughly soaked with a solution containing magnetic particles. If there's a fracture, the particles contained in the solution will adhere to the edges of the fracture and make it visible. This shaft is in sound shape, since there is no indication of cracks. So that you will recognize a fracture when you see it, here is a fractured shaft from another engine. Notice how the particles cling to the line of the crack and bring it into relief. A fractured shaft must be replaced. When the inspection is complete, the shaft must be demagnetized by moving it back and forth inside a coil chamber and then removing it slowly. But you must be certain, too, that the shaft is not out of alignment. A stand like this is most efficient for this test. A dial indicator put on the shaft will check it for route or straightness when the shaft is rotated. Make this check with the indicator on the end of the shaft. Make another check with the indicator on the center main bearing surface. The needle on the dial shouldn't vary more than is allowed by your table of limits. You can check in your engine manual for the maximum runout allowance. On this engine, it's five thousandths of an inch. Now you need to measure the seven bearing surfaces of the shaft in order to determine clearances. On this shaft, there are three main bearing surfaces where the shaft rotates on the bearings in the case. There are also four bearing surfaces where the connecting rods are attached to the shaft. Use a micrometer of the right size to measure the diameter of the shaft. The purpose of these measurements and checking of clearances is to discover wear that wouldn't be visible to the eye. Take a measurement in two directions to check for out of round. <laughs> 
If there's a slight difference in the reading in different positions on the shaft, record the smaller diameter on your check sheet. The next bearing surface is for a connecting rod. Measure this diameter in the same way and record the smaller measurement. Later, you will measure the connecting rod bearing and, by subtraction, get the clearance. Now, measure each of the other five bearing surfaces and rec record the diameters. When that's done, you're finished with the crankshaft for the time being and can go ahead with an inspection of the connecting rods. Take the rod apart and slip the bearing out. Check the bearing seat for cracks, nicks, or scores. Examine the split bearings for scores, chipping, or flaking. Give the rod itself a careful checking over. Here's a bearing that's scored. This score is deep enough so the bearing will have to be replaced. These split bearings are always replaced in pairs not individually. The bearings fit easily into the seat and they'll only go in one way. You can't go wrong. So far, this rod is in good condition. Bolt, bolt it back together so you can give it a check for possible bend or twist. To make this check, insert a special mandrel through each of the holes in the rod, using shafts so that fit snugly. To make the check accurately, tighten the nuts with a wrench. Now prepare a set of parallel bars with four metal gauge blocks on the surface plate. Then rest the ends of the mandrels on the blocks like this. Now compare the distance between the ends of the mandrels on each side of the rod. Use a dial indicator for accuracy. The dial indicator reading should be exactly the same on each side of the rod if the connecting rod is perfectly straight. Now make a check for twist. If the ends of the mandrels rest firmly on the gauge blocks, and there's no wobble at the corners, the rod is not twisted.
with all the connecting rods inspected and with damaged part replaced, next measure the bearings at each end to obtain clearances. Before doing that, however, let's be sure of the clearances we're after. You've already measured the diameter of the crankshaft at the four throws where the connecting rods fit. Now you want to measure the diameter of the bearing in the large end of the connecting rod. Then by subtraction, you can find out what the clearance is between the crankshaft and the connecting rod bearing. In operation, the crankshaft is nearly centered in the rod like this with clearance for oil all the way around. Of course, when you check the clearance, your figure will represent the total, as if the rod were pushed to one side. Now make the measurements. Use a telescoping gauge and micrometer to measure the diameter of the bearing through which the crankshaft fits. Take your measurement in more than one direction, and if there's a slight variation, use the larger diameter. Now to figure the clearance between the crankshaft and some connecting rod bearing, subtract to get the difference. Check this clearance with that given in the table of limits in your manual. Your clearance is satisfactory. The bearing in the small end of the connecting rod where the piston pin fits also needs to be measured. Measure this diameter in more than one direction, and if there's a difference, use the larger diameter. Record this measurement, and you can obtain the clearance between the piston pin and the bearing. You'll remember that you measured the diameter of the piston pin when you overhauled the pistons. Now you can get the clearance between the piston pin and the bearing in the small end of the connecting rod by subtracting one diameter from the other. Now look up the allowable clearance and the table of limits in your engine manual. Your clearance is okay. Give each of the four connecting rods an equally thorough examination and measure the bearing diameters in the same way. You've now completed your inspection of the crankshaft and connecting rods. The camshaft, the two halves of the crankcase, and the other disassembled parts remain to be overhauled before the engine can be reassembled. All of these engine parts have been thoroughly inspected. Necessary repairs and replacements have been made, and all clearances have been checked. You're ready to reassemble the engine and replace it in the airplane. The first step is to assemble the connecting rods to the crankshaft. Check the tag to see where the rod goes and remove the tag. Now separate the two parts of the rod and oil the bearing surfaces thoroughly, both on the crankshaft and the rod itself. 
install the rod on the crankshaft throw, oil the cap, and bolt the two parts together. Install the rod so that the number will face upward when the rod is in its cylinder port. have been installed. Tighten the nuts carefully with a torque wrench to the value specified in the table of limits. The castle nuts used here must be safetyed with cutter pins. Tap the pin in with a soft face mallet and then bend the two ends back neatly. are safety. Use a flurry gauge to check the end clearance of each rod on its throw. You'll find the specified end clearance given in the table of limits. Now to reassemble the gear case cover. Put a new gasket on the oil screen and dip the screen in clean engine oil. Then screw it in, wipe off excessive oil, and tighten it securely. Install a plastic plug in the thermometer hole temporarily to keep dirt out. A new oil seal should be installed in the tachometer drive housing. This is a very snug fit. the new seal into place with a soft face mallet. Then install a new gasket on the tachometer drive housing. The tachometer drive housing and oil pump gears are installed together. Oil the two gears and install them. Install the oil pump cover plate over the studs and the gear shaft and safety it. To prevent the tachometer drive oil seal from being pushed out of place when you install it, insert a rod through the seal. Match the end of the rod to the shaft and guide the tachometer drive housing down over the shaft. Then screw the tachometer drive housing in and tighten it. Don't over tighten it. Notice that it has a left hand thread so the rotation of the shaft won't loosen it. Next, install the oil pressure relief valve. Use a new gasket on the cap. Then install the valve 
the spring and the cap, cap and tighten the assembly securely. This completes the assembly of the gear case cover, but there's one more check to make. Test the oil oil pump gears to be sure they run freely. They shouldn't bind. Now you're ready to mount the 2-4 crankcase on the engine stand. Before inserting the hydraulic tappets in their guides, remove the plunger and dip the tappet in clean oil. Then it in its guide. Do the same with the other three. Then install the tappet in the other crankcase case. They'll remain in place in the 2-4 crankcase, but in the 1-3 crankcase, you'll have to prevent them from dropping out when you turn the case over to install it. You can do this by temporarily slipping a push rod hose connection over the end of the tappet on the outside of the case. Now make sure each of the bearings gets a thorough oiling. Use oil very liberally as you reassemble the engine. each of the bearing surfaces of the camshaft and lay the camshaft and its bearings in the crankcase. Now oil the bearing surfaces of the crankshaft and lay the crankshaft and its bearings in the crankcase. Careful to guide the two and four connecting rods through the cylinder ports so they won't damage the sides of the ports. Check the front end clearance of the crankshaft with a feeler gauge. You'll find specifications for this end clearance in your table of limits. Make a similar end clearance check on the camshaft. Dip the oil seal in oil and push it securely into place on the front of the crankshaft. Apply a very thin film of sealing compound to the outside edges of the cutting surfaces of both halves of the crankcase. 
can install the 1-3 crankcase on the 2-4 case. Guide the one and three connecting rods carefully through the cylinder ports and be sure you get the dowel bolts to their proper locations. With the two sections fitted together, you can reinstall the bolts that hold them. Before you put all the bolts in, however, check the crankshaft and the camshaft to be sure they move freely. Then you can finish bolting the crankcase together. All the nuts should tighten evenly to the torque value given in the table of limits. This will prevent undue stresses on the crankcase. These nuts are safetyed with pal nuts. The correct, correct way to install a pal nut is to run it down finger tight with the open end up and then give it a quarter turn with a wrench. Now reinstall the camshaft gear in position for correct valve timing. A valve timing mark is stamped on the side of one of the cam gear teeth. To synchronize the two shafts, that mark should mesh between the two timing marks stamped on the crankshaft gear. To position the camshaft, reach through a cylinder port and rotate it until the bolt holes line up. They'll only match in one way. Then install the bolts that secure the gear to the camshaft. Tighten the bolts evenly to the torque value specified in your table of limits and safety them. To check the backlash of the camshaft and crankshaft gears, Set up a dial indicator with its arm flush against the tooth of the camshaft gear. Now, holding the crankshaft gear with your left hand, move the camshaft gear back and forth. The amount of play shown on the dial should be checked against your table of limits. If you have too much play, you will have to replace the gear. This one's okay. Now you're ready to install the gear case cover, and the first step is to install a new gasket over the studs. This gasket has to go on flush against the crankcase so the holes fit properly over the studs and line up with the main oil passages in the crankcase. Before you install the cover, give both gears a generous application of oil. Then put some oil into the oil pump to lubricate those gears. And fit the gear case cover on the studs and assemble the washers and nuts. Tighten the nuts evenly to the torque value given in the table of limits and stick to them with pound nuts. <laughs> 
At this point, you can safety the oil screen to a gear case cover button. However, do not safety the oil pressure relief valve cap at this time, as the final adjustment will be made when you run in the engine. Now turn the engine upside down so you can get at the oil sump opening. With a sharp knife, cut off the portion of the gear case cover gasket that crosses the opening. Be sure not to let any of the gasket material drop into the case. Install the oil suction tube for the new gasket in the tapped hole in the bottom of the gear case cover. Screw it in and tighten it with a wrench. The tube should be safety to the gear case cover. New gasket for the oil sump on the mounting studs. Then fit the oil sump on the six mounting studs, being careful not to damage the tube as you do to do so. Reinstall the nuts and safety them. Reinstall the oil plug with a new gasket in the bottom of the sump and then safety it. Now you can remove the connections that you use to hold the tappets in place and rotate the engine to a position convenient for installing the hydraulic plungers. Dip the plungers in oil and pump them several times to remove the air and fill them with oil. Insert the units, tube in first in the cam follower body. Then insert the tappet cups. The units have all been, all been installed. Put a new gasket over the studs and replace the push rod housing flange over the studs and gasket. Install the nuts and safety them with pal nuts. Now install the propeller hub key, tapping it into place carefully with a soft faced mallet. You're ready now to install the pistons and cylinders. When they're all in place, reinstall all the spark plugs and reconnect the ignition wires. Check the timing of the valves, referring to your engine manual for opening and closing points. And finally, with the engine reinstalled on the airplane, mount the two magnetos and time them to the engine. This will put the plane in readiness for a ground run-up after which there should be a final check before the flight test.
job will be a whole lot easier if you're systematic about it. Line up the cylinders and pistons so you can work on them in order. Notice that all the parts are tagged, so there'll be no question where they go when you reinstall them. Now you can go to work on the cylinders. Take the push rods out and lay them aside, and take the connections off the push rod housings. Now, remove the six screws that hold the rocker box cover to the cylinder. There's no safety wire to cut here because lock washers are used instead. Remove the rocker box cover so you can get at the rocker arms. Sometimes the gasket will stick to the parting surface. You can loosen it with a flat blade, but don't use a sharp screwdriver as it may damage the parting surface. This rocker arm shaft comes out easily. Sometimes you'll have to tap them out with a soft drift. Be sure to tag the rocker arm so you'll know which is exhaust and which is intake. You're ready now to clean the cylinder. A revolving wire brush on the end of a drill is good for removing carbon from the head. Be careful, though, not to scratch the cylinder walls with it. The outside dirt and oil will come off by using a spray gun and cleaning solvent. Then compressed air will not only dry the cylinder, but will blow off dirt and carbon. Before you can take the valve assembly apart, place the cylinder over a wooden form that fits the inside of the cylinder head. This will hold the valves in place when the springs are compressed. You'll also need a simple tool like this to compress the springs. A pair of tweezers is handy for picking out the little split locks. They're hard to pick out with your fingers. With the split locks removed, the compressing tool can be taken away and the parts lifted out the spring retainer, and the inner and outer springs. You can get the spring seat out with the tweezers, too. Hold the valve stems as you take the cylinder off the form so they won't drop out. Take care when removing the valves not to let them scratch or dent the cylinder walls. Now examine the cylinder head very carefully. A 10-power magnifying glass is a big help. If cracks are found, or if the head is loose, the whole cylinder will have to be replaced. Examine the cooling fins carefully for cracks. One of the fins on this cylinder is chipped and will have to be repaired so it won't get bigger. Profiling is what the repair job is called. Use a round file at the apex of the crack to prevent it from going further. Then use a flat file to smooth off the edges. Next, inspect the flange for nicks, evenness, and condition of the hold-down nut recesses. 
The rough edges of any nicks you find can be smoothed down. Fine stone dipped in oil is the correct tool for this. Then polish the spot with a piece of crocus cloth. An aircraft engine usually can be run several hundred hours before it has to be reconditioned. The engine on this airplane has done a lot of flying, and it's due for an overhaul. It's a little engine, but it runs on exactly the same principles as the big jobs. And the inspections and repairs you'll do on it are basically the same. So let's get the airplane inside the hangar and go to work. While you're letting the engine... One of the first things you ought to do is be sure all the tools you'll need for the job are handy. You don't want to waste time hunting for the right tool. That means you'll have not only screwdrivers, wrenches, drifts, and the like, but measuring gauges, containers, funnels, clean rags, and metal tags for marking parts as they're taken from the engine. You'll also need an engine manual containing a table of limits and helpful instruction on proper procedures. Since you're interested chiefly in the cylinders, the preliminary steps you take before removing the cylinders will be covered quickly. Check the ignition switch and fuel shutoff valve to be sure they're both off. Move the engine's, engine's cowling, including the baffles. On this airplane, you'll have to remove the propeller to get the front cowling off. Now you can spray the whole engine with cleaning solvent and dry it with compressed air to get rid of the oil and dirt that's accumulated. And always keep a fire extinguisher handy for an emergency. Next, disconnect the ignition wiring for spark plugs. Then remove the spark plugs themselves from the engine. Now you'll have to take off the exhaust stacks and disconnect the intake pipes from the cylinders. Then the push rod housings can be disconnected and you'll be ready to pull the cylinders. You'll find an exploded diagram of the cylinder and valve assembly in the engine manual. You're concerned now only with the cylinders. Later, the valve mechanism will have to be gone over. Powell nuts are used on this engine to safety the cylinder hold-down nuts. Remove them first. It's always a good idea to string nuts on a piece of wire. Examine the inside of the cylinder bar barrel thoroughly for dents and scoring. The wall of this cylinder is in good condition. Sometimes you'll find a cylinder has been scored like this one. This cylinder would have to be rebored before it can be used again, or perhaps replaced. Since cylinder barrel is in good shape, you can go ahead with the job. You're ready now to check for out of round and taper. First, look up the maximum allowed in the table of limits. The taper wear and out of round allowed is two thousandths of an inch. Use a dial indicator to check the cylinder bore. Set the dial to zero. As you glide the indicator along the barrel, watch the dial to see if the pointer varies more than two thousandths of an inch. The taper of this cylinder is satisfactory, so you're ready to check the diameter of the cylinder. With inside micrometer, take one measurement at right angles to the crankshaft. 
Take a second measurement in a direction parallel with the crankshaft. A comparison of these measurements will tell you if the cylinder is out of round. Record the larger diameter of the cylinder barrel on a check sheet. Later on, you will measure the piston and subtract its diameter from the diameter of the cylinder. In that way, you will find out if the clearance between the piston and cylinder checks with the table of limits. It's a good idea to check the threads of the spark plug insert. Damaged threads can be fixed up by chasing them with a tap and get lost. With the pal nuts off, remove four of the six hold down nuts, leaving two nuts on temporarily to hold the cylinder in place. Before pulling the cylinder, Put the piston at the top of its stroke so that you can get at it when the cylinder is off. You can do this easily by turning the crankshaft with a timing tool and watching the piston through a spark plug insert. Now you can remove the last two nuts and the cylinder will be free to come off. There are several things to remember when pulling a cylinder. Do it carefully. Pull the cylinder out straight. Use one hand to support the piston so it won't bang down against the engine when the cylinder comes free. Keeping one hand on the piston, lay the cylinder down carefully. push out the full floating wrist pin that holds the piston to the connecting rod. And when you take the piston off, let the rod down gently so it won't drop against the port. Whenever you tear an engine down, you have to be sure each part goes back in its original position. There are so many identical parts that you can't remember where each one goes, so tag it as you take it off. Metal identification tag tags are best because you can dunk them in cleaning fluid and the number won't come off. As soon as the cylinders are pulled, be sure you cover up the open cylinder port so dirt loose wire, nuts, or tools can't get inside accidentally. When you've removed all the cylinders and pistons and covered up all the open ports, you can move to a workbench where it's easier to make your inspection and repairs.